everybody from 902. So let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Sunfox. I'm the Director of Operations at Collider and uh, co organizer of One Million Cups Rochester. Uh, thank you for coming out today to our March One Million Cups. Uh, I always know, now that I've been in Discovery Square a little bit, when the sun is, is sort of, uh, you know the seasons are about to change when you're kind of blinded for the first half hour, so that's always a great sign. Uh, how many, uh, actually, Mark, can you help me out with it? Oh, Garrett. I've got to take a poll of the audience, and then count it. So, could, and this is very democratic. Uh, how many people are here for the first time? Raise your hand, please. Okay, keep your hand up. You need to count. Okay. Got it? I, I'm not allowed to count. Uh, all right, and how many uh, are entrepreneurs? Okay. All right, got it? Yeah, forget it. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you right now. Thank you so much. Um, we use this data to report back to one million cups in uh, home base in Kansas City and uh, let them know how many people are attending and uh, how many entrepreneurs we have in our audience. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, what is One Million Cups? One Million Cups is a free event in our, in our, in Rochester, it's held monthly, that features two entrepreneurs talking about uh, their, their company, what they're doing, and really a challenge that they have that they would ask all of you to help uh, them overcome. Uh, so, you'll hear, uh, what can the community do for you? So, as you're listening to these presentations, please, uh, please start thinking, how can I help this presenter? Uh, how can I help move their business forward? Because it really takes a community of people uh, to help a business. So uh, we want to thank our sponsors, first and foremost, the Ewing Marion Coffee Foundation, uh, for allowing us to run One Million Cups here. Uh, right now, at 9 o'clock on Wednesday, there's 160 million cups going on around the country, which is really amazing. Uh, They've been very generous, all the sort of the banners and things like that, that those are totally free and provided by the Kauffman Foundation. And I think they're just an excellent organization that really care about entrepreneurs. Uh, our other sponsors, who are more local sponsors that we love, are Collider, Destination Medical Center, CETA, the Music Camp Group, The Bee Shed, Ready, Trail Creek Coffee Roasters, and Dunkin' Donuts. So we can give our sponsors all around round of applause. I did not. And let's have a big shout out because they're right here to Cafe Steam, our other sponsor. All right, without further ado, um, I, I, I always sometimes remember and sometimes forget to do this, but we'll, we'll, let, uh, we'll let Christina come up. And, uh, Please set your coffee down. Don't knock it over on people. And give a standing ovation. Yes, we get a standing ovation for Christina from Healing Rhythms Music Therapy. So that's how um, I feel very blessed to be able to share about how we're using music 
to combine our passion of helping people and making a difference in our community. So, like I said, I'm here today to share how our team of music therapists are serving not only Rochester, but greater southern Minnesota. But I'm guessing that many of you had maybe no idea what music therapy was before today. Some of you are awesome partners in our community already, but some of you maybe have no idea. And so, I just want to share a little bit um, about what we do before I go into how we're better serving. But there's about 9,000 music therapists in the U.S. who are board certified to practice. We have to have a degree in music therapy. Um, but we're specifically trained to use music as our tool to help people of all ages and all abilities. And I'm really honored to have 10 board certified music therapists on our team that are based right here in Rochester and across greater Southern Minnesota. So I did start my career in 2006 as a solo entrepreneur, and I was in the cities. And I grew up in rural Minnesota, and now I had a dream to start a medical music therapy program at Mayo. And I had that opportunity in 2007, relocated. And I started with contractors, but I quickly realized that my goal was to build a cohesive team. I really wanted to provide support to people who were burning out or working in isolation. So I quickly switched my model to employees. And then fast forward to 2017 when we opened the first music therapy clinic in rural Minnesota, outside of the Twin Cities. But um, really, in the last three years, so you're probably wondering, well, I'm not in business, right? We have grown so much, and so I'm gonna talk about our growth in the community and why I'm here today, because we're, we're opening a new chapter, and that's what we really want to help with today. So our vision, the entire time our mission has been, how do we increase that? high quality music therapy services. And I'm showing a lot of pictures because I can't, I can't take you with me, I wish I could. Um, but not just in Rochester, but across greater um, Southern Minnesota. So we're, we're providing a continuity of care for the patient experience from the health system and the rural areas back to Rochester and we're referring them back home to our team. And um, the really great thing is that our team is small, but we're many. So just in 2019, we served over 17,000 people just last year. So even though we're small, we are making a difference. And so we're really continuing to focus on educating the community of what it is that we do and how we benefit people regardless of their, if they're here for medical care, if there's somebody with a disability, if they're recovering from a stroke or a car accident, or maybe somebody's in hospice at MLA, how do we use music in that journey to help process grief? with pain management, to teach social skills to children, to um, maybe like last week we were here doing a wellness event to help people just like you who are healthy. How do you use music for stress management? Um, how to unwind after a difficult day? How do we take care of us in this busy world? But all of these things have led us up to today of uh, how we're serving and in our community partners. So our focus is really on how do we serve the community. So we have all these community partnerships, because many places go and need a music therapist full time. So we go in and we partner with them and we staff them. Like for example, Spark, or the old, yeah, Spark. You're not Spark, it's still in the museum. Um, so we go in and provide creative music-based development programming for children. We partner with medical facilities, with hospices, with skilled nursing, memory care, uh, special education classrooms, kind of the sky's the limit. But then we also had the clinic where we were serving kids and adults with special needs. We also do lots of education. We do research in the community. We have several studies running at Mayo Clinic right now. But what we have learned is the need has continued to grow. So I'm really excited to share with you that we are taking a huge leap of faith and we just purchased a new building, the old reading center, a civic center drive to continue better service And so our goal is to have more space to serve kids and adults with disabilities, kids with autism, um, people recovering from stroke or other genetic injuries, uh, but to also be a hub for early childhood music and using that to teach development and to empower parents. We will finally have ample space for our team to actually work and to learn and to grow. Uh, ample parking, which is always a plus in this city. But my question to you today is even though we have all these visions, how can we better serve this community? How can we keep serving and growing as we're growing at a rapid rate? And keeping 
very innovative hub for the only music therapy center in, outside of the Twin Cities. And so, um, of course, the best question to ask you is what can you do for us, right? So this beautiful little girl here, we were very honored to meet her at a traumatic point right after birth. We met her in the ICU in her mom. And we walked alongside her for the last five years. She's alive. And if you would ask her mom to they would say that music therapy is one of the number one things that taught her how to bond with her parents in those really special moments, how to learn to develop on the skills, how to walk, how to talk, and now she loves running for a living and coming every week. So we want you to share our story because stories are colorful. And we want you to tell people that we're a resource. We are truly here to support. We couldn't do it without our community members and people like you in the community. Um, but also connect us with stakeholders that you might know. So that's kind of our big ask of how we think we can help, but I'm really happy to hear questions of how we can keep growing and serving. Thank you. So one of my questions was going to be on the insurance aspect, which you just answered. Um, but I also wanted to 
give a shout out for what you did uh, or what you worked on. My grandfather was a theater his entire life, and then he lost his ability to speak. But one of my last moments with him was witnessing him and with his music therapist, and he sang amazingly at 93 years old. It was the most beautiful thing probably I've ever seen. So I love what you do, but I love your industry and what you provide to people. Thank you for sharing that. We, we get a lot of very precious, priceless moments at end of life, and we can't change the outcome, but we have become very skilled at partnering with hospices or the Center for Palliative Medicine in not only doing research, but providing services at end of life and in very difficult situations that, like with your grandpa, we can't change that, but if we can make that moment a little more beautiful and a really bittersweet memory, then we've done our job. The other thing that we've been working really hard on, and we're leaving, Destiny is here with me, but we're leaving tonight and tomorrow for Chicago for our regional conference. But we now have the capability to record somebody's heartbeat and then to record a song with it that's meaningful to that family or that patient and edit it and give it as a legacy gift for people on the way. So if any of you are super skilled in tech and editing, we're constantly trying to refine that process and we're doing our best, but if that's your wheelhouse, I would love to talk with you. Yes.
me to our next presenter, who happened to be here first of anyone today. And we started chatting, and he's like, well, I have this uh, nicely monogrammed Rochester Curling Club uh, swag. Would you like to hear about the Curling Club? And I said, well, of course. Let's replace one sport with another. It makes perfect sense. So uh, without further ado, here's Marty from the Rochester Curling Club. It's the Curling Club of Rochester. If you go to Rochester Curling Club, you will end up like many unfortunate people at our airport, and you'll be in New York instead of here. So it's the Curling Club of Rochester. Um, and I'm, I'm going to put a disclaimer. This was a slide deck that I had made for another event that we did a little while ago. So uh, A, it might, I might have missed updating something, and it might not be perfectly focused, and I might have to run through it a little bit longer. So, Again, I'm Marty Walsh, I'm a board member with the Curling Club of Rochester. Uh, we've got our board president, another board member, um, Steve Katie up top, so thanks for them for showing up short notice. Um, and we are a, uh, so Curling Club of Rochester is a, uh, a social club, support club that was founded about three years ago in Rochester. Um, curling is a ancient sport, goes back hundreds of years, Founded in Scotland, it's an Olympic sport, one of the oldest Olympic sports in the modern Olympics. Uh, traditionally, it's pretty popular in northern countries, so you're seeing it pop up all over the world. Very big in Korea, in India, um, and it's a highly social, very affordable, and very accessible sport that we think is a, a great thing to be growing in Rochester. So there, there's two teams at a time, four curls. And then we hear, who, who here has curled and said, thrown a stone, done anything? Awesome. So, you have two teams of four. They're throwing 42 pound granite stones down about 145 feet of ice. And they're basically trying to get as close to the target as possible. So they play six to eight ends, kind of like an inning, so when you're throwing in one direction. And uh, usually about two hours. You talk a lot afterwards. You usually go out and, and socialize, do some broom stacking, we call it. There's some sweeping involved, but, but that's the gist of the sport. You have a lot of time to talk to people. We think that that's something that Rochester could really benefit from. We all need to get out of our shells a little bit and move on. Um, and a, a, a fun fact about those stones, every official curling stone in the world comes from the same quarry in Scotland. They have about an 800 year supply of granite remaining there. Um, so it, it's a very, very old fashioned kind of special thing. So, Curling is a rapidly growing sport. It's the fastest growing Olympic sport, according to the USOC. Um, and it's doubled the number of participating nations in just 10 years. So it's really interesting to watch. You'll see these Olympic level curlers and say, you know, Scotland, this guy's been in Canada, this guy's been curling for 32 years. Kazakhstan, this guy's been curling for two years. And he's in the Olympics, so it's fun. Uh, Minnesota has over 10,000 registered curlers. Uh, and we're seeing the growth pretty rapidly. There, there's this number is out of date already. There were four recent new clubs, um, dedicated ice facilities up in the cities, and already I think there's two new ones that are coming. And when we say dedicated ice, what we mean is an ice facility that is only for curling. So we curl right now on Arena Ice at the North Arena directly, uh, rec center. Um, it's very important to have very smooth, very level ice. It's so all those gouges and stuff make it kind of more interesting to curl, definitely. If we compare it to curling on the, to putting on the green versus putting off the fairway, uh, it, you can do it, but it's it's different. Um, and so we're seeing the, the explosion of new dedicated ice facilities. And uh, there's also a new arena club, so we're a relatively new club. Austin is a brand new club. Uh, Wilmer has a new club on the last few years. So we we're seeing it expand even in these smaller kind of regional center communities. Um, and the, the explosion of dedicated ice is really just helping. So Chaska has the new National Curling Center. It is a beautiful curling center. Um, six Sheep Silly, I have some pictures of it. And that's just people are going there, they're doing corporate events there, and then they're coming back to the communities and they want to keep on curling. So in Rochester, we had a club uh, back in the day, even from the 50s or 60s, I understand, through the mid to late 90s. And the reason that is very popular, but the reason that expanded was a lack of consistent ice. They had they struggled with that, and so we we know we know that that's something that can be difficult for the club to overcome. Um, we have a lot of curlers actually. To add this number, we did some research. About 35 people who are curlers in Rochester, but do not curl with us. And the majority of them are traveling to other cities 
um, Otana, St. Paul, or across the river in Centerville, which is by Winona. Um, they're to curl on dedicated ice. They're leaving town, they're taking their money with them one to three nights a week. Um, and we know that if we had dedicated ice, we could probably get them here. Or there's some of those guys who are just not curling um, because either you know, there's, they feel they're out of practice or unfortunately we curl at 7.30 and 9.30 on Sunday nights. And so uh, for some people getting off the ice at 11.30, 11.45 and getting home at midnight is just not an option when you work at four or five in the morning. Um, we launched as a club uh, in 2016-17 and had our inaugural season in 2018. Is that number right, Steve? I'm not even sure. Steve's the we in that sentence, not me. So, uh, we, we currently host about three leagues a year. It's very dependent upon ice time at the rec center. Uh, we have a, traditionally had a fall league, an instructional league, where we'll have some coaches on hand, and it's a little bit shorter um, season than the spring season. Um, and again, we curl at 7.30, 9.30 p.m. on Sunday nights. Ice time is, of course, a big issue. We need it to be consistent, and it's very competitive. If you have kids in hockey, or figure skating, or speed skating, you know this, or if you were in them. Um, we do host nearly a dozen learn to curls, or curling and cocktails, so they're one-off events, either two-hour intensive instructional, or a one-hour instructional, then we buy your first beer. Um, and we also <laughs> host an outdoor rink at uh, Little Thistle Brewing, underneath, this year we did underneath their solar pagoda, you may have seen. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of fun there. But that's very weather dependent and it's not great ice. Again, it's now we're going from the fairway to the rough in that situation. Uh, we have over 100 league members. I think last night we were at 104 registered members. These are people who are paying 150 to $300, depending on how much they're curling, per year, again, to be on the ice until midnight some night. So we have some very passionate and engaged people. Um, and uh, I think that really speaks to the economic value of this club as well. And in the 2018-19 season, we actually interact with over a thousand people on the ice. We know we're probably right around that, if not past that this year as well, even though we didn't have as good of weather outdoors uh, for our outdoor ice. Uh, but we regularly host events outside of Rochester. We've gone to Owatonna to do clinics. We host an entire bond spiel, which is a tournament over in Centerville, because we can't do it here. So uh, that, that's one of the issues that we're facing. So dedicated ice is right for Rochester for a number of reasons. Um, it's a welcoming sport. You can curl, if you can't get down to that delivery position, you can still curl this. If you're in a wheelchair, you could still curl in a normal game. It's, it's a very accessible sport. Uh, it's also linguistically accessible, so that's something I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, we've had a few players who English is not their first language. It's all hand signals. It doesn't really matter. Once you get the gist of it, you can play with us very well. Um, you build networks outside of work. We all know in Rochester, we get a little pigeonholed sometimes into the people in our lab or in our office or anything. You're standing around for a long time. You have nothing else to do but talk to somebody while you're waiting for stones to throw. Uh, so it's great because you can, you can build a team with strangers very quickly. It's a, kind of those five minutes to learn life and master sports. Um, and it's a winter sport that's played indoor. So we all know how terrible it is to find things to do in wintertime. Um, it undoubtedly has that bold north feel to it, and yet it's indoors, it's more controlled and more comfortable. Um, it's healthy and active, and it's kind of becoming part of the Minnesota brand, so as we're identifying as Minnesota Rochester, it's helping us being remembered by our visitors. It's something where you could come to Mayo for a wellness visit, you could do anything, and you could do curling for an hour, and you're gonna bond with that city so closely. And then Bonchville's gonna attract hundreds of participants. So we were at Bonchville in Chaska, um, there were 32 teams, and each of those teams is at least four, maybe as much as six people. I can guarantee we spent a lot of money in Chaska that weekend, um, outside of the curling center even. So there's a couple of different development models, and this, this presentation was designed to kind of inform some potential partners um, who maybe are at a stage of their development that they might want to reach out to us to partner. So this, kind of a little weird. So one model is a standalone club where the club owns a bar or restaurant or they have just a banquet facility so we can do a, the broom stacking afterwards. We own the ice, we host everything there. Um, and then we can rent it off, off season or if we grow enough, we can go year round. There are year round curling centers. The other model is maybe having a bar partner or municipal partner where they own everything and we rent the ice space from them and or uh, maybe we own the building and they rent the space from the restaurant, that's how Chaska works. 
So there's a lot of different organization structures here, depending upon what an investment partner might want to look at. Uh, so really quick example, this is Centerville over Wisconsin Friday Club. They actually share with their town hall, so they have a, a city-owned kitchen in there. They have their banquet facilities, they do all their voting. And then the bar section is through a separate door so that they all have to pay the liquor license on that. Uh, arena style seating to look in there. Um, and it, it just builds communities. It's, it's a very, very friendly space. This is Chaska, the National Curling Center. So it's a six sheet facility. Um, the, the windows in that right hand picture are the windows on the left side of the left hand picture. So there's a crooked pint. Um, in there, and you can sit there and have your beer and eat your Juicy Lucy and watch people curl. Um, that's a very wonderful curling center. Um, the curling club is a little less social there. So we're, we're in the process of determining what's going to work best for us. We, we found that we are a really good social touch point. And I probably put this slide in the wrong spot. I just added it. So we were invited to... Um, and because of our success hosting Little Thistle, we were invited by the Rochester Downtown Association to do curling at Socialites. We had over 600 people out on the ice with us. We figured we had about 2,000 people ob observing or watching and being part of that family. Um, and we, we've heard pretty consistently that that drove a lot of people to go to Socialites for either the first time or the first time in a while. And again, this wasn't perfect. We couldn't be out there Thursday because it wasn't cold enough yet. We also came off of our bond spiel the weekend before, so we were a little tapped out for volunteers. Uh, but it was still a raging success, and uh, we were seeing already opportunities coming off of this. So we know that if we can gain the sponsors, we're gonna get them in front of thousands of people in a pretty intimate setting. So our basic needs for a facility, 12 to 14,000 square feet of indoor space on an acre of land we were to build, room for ice making, we estimate that on the low end, we're starting at about a million dollars in development costs. Um, and then we want to have a club warming room, we want to have food and alcohol, and we um, ideally would be inside the Circle Drive area of Rochester, so if you know somebody who's like starting a new restaurant, they want a unique feature to it, if it's in that area, we would love to talk to them. Um, but overall, you know, we're not stupid. If you, uh, if you want to give us some free land over in Byron or something, we'll come over there too. <laughs> so, at least we'll talk about it. Uh, and what you can do to help today is you can help connect with you can connect with us on social media, um, help us find partners. We are looking for sponsorships, and I'll touch on that for a little bit. Um, advocate our goals for our goals, and most importantly, come curl. Uh, we have a curling and cocktails on March 25th up at the Rec Center. You can find it on Facebook or our website, curlrochester.com. Um, info at curlrochester.com if you have questions. We uh, do offer sponsorships also. I did put on there for our stones and our brooms and, and what? And scoreboards. Uh, so we still, need, we still need some sponsorships. The stones, it's laser engraved right on that handle. Um, you can sponsor it personally or you can sponsor it as a corporation and do a single stone or a set of eight stones. They are very, very noticeable. Um, anytime we've got a public event, people are asking about them. So if that's something your com company is interested in, it's, uh, I think it's probably the best deal we had out there. Um, we had a league that we are just starting to organize probably in April and May, um, and it won't ideally be super late at night, or it'll be like a Sunday afternoon, early evening thing, we think, but follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we have some corporate ice opportunities coming up, and we're structuring that. And the big one is we are sending a team to the Women's Arena Nationals competition in Gillette, Wyoming. And that's gonna be about a four to $5,000 cost that those women are picking up on their own. Uh, there's 16 women teams, 32 men's teams, but it's a huge opportunity and we're looking for some sponsors to partner with us on that and help send that team out there. Um, some really nice national visibility as well as we'll probably do a local t-shirt like the team, the team can sponsor, so your, your name would be out there. Um, but yeah, go to curlrochester.com, like us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, and uh, good curling. Woo. So, any questions? Marty, do I need to put together a team to show up, or can I just show up by myself? Wonderful question. So, um, at Curling Cocktails, absolutely just show up by yourself. And if you want to do a league or a pop-up event, um, well, pop-up events, yeah, show up on your own. If you want to do a league, we offer individual registration as well. 
and we'll either um, assign you to a team, like if you say, I really want to be with an experienced person, or when we just get groups of individuals who sign up, so we'll kind of group you together as well. So yeah, you can do this as an individual or a team, or as a partial team and say, hey, we've got three, we need one or two more. And you can also be a sub, so if you can't be there regularly, but random Sunday nights you're available, we can put you on the sub list. So like last week, my team, uh, one of our members twisted her ankle, and so we needed to call in a sub off the sub list to come in and curl with us. So if I wanted to curl for the first time, So curling cocktails would be the perfect place to go for that first, first time. Uh, it's, it's geared toward people who have never been on the ice at all. Um, and then it, when we have them, the pop curling events in season are another really good thing. Um, but so Steve's been curling for 30 some years. 30, 25? 25 years. The average of our club, though, is probably somewhere around two years. Uh, I've, been, yeah, I've been on the ice two years, Katie's been on the ice two years. Um, we are constantly growing and adding new people. So it, your first time out, not a problem at all. Even if you come to a league, we've had people show up to a competitive league and they've never been on the ice at all. So. So you can you pay the curling club of Rochester. Um, uh, curling and cocktails is thirty five. Um, uh, they're they're all right around there for those one time events. Um, a league, you have to be a member, which is either sixty or thirty, depending on when you sign up. And then a team is four hundred. So if you have four people, five people, six people divide from there. Um, so, but we the the pop up curling events are generally free. Um, if you want to do a corporate event indoors. You pay the ice time, we volunteer the rest. In the winter time when we are outside, um, there's a small setup fee and then that's it. And you can email info at curling, or at curlrochester.com with questions. Marty, with the club, are you guys creating an investment for a potential uh, building on your own sometime, or is the only way that'll work is if there's an investment opportunity so we are in the process of figuring out what's going to work there. We would certainly, you know, if we could bring together the funding, if we saw um, that we could cash flow based on membership and we could get the, the loan or the funding, we would be interested in potentially doing that on our own. Um, if somebody wants to partner with us, we're, we're kind of structuring that right now. We just came off, we probably did six, 700 volunteer hours in the last six weeks. Um, so we were pretty stressed on just that, and now we're moving into this more formal capital campaigning, just deciding our path forward. Um, do you have, um, how many so, excellent question. Why is it called curling? Um, if you were to take just a normal glass from steam and throw it across the table and spin it, it would spin that way off to the side. Curling, it, it's some weird physics that nobody understands. Literally, there's competing academic papers on this. But when you throw that stone, you, you turn a little bit as you throw it, and it will go out and around. Uh, and so if you're curling the rocks. You can tuck the rocks behind other rocks. You can come from different angles when you come and try and get in the house. Uh, so it's because of the movement of the stone that's called that. Why is it six to eight like rock? Why is it like eight? Because, because that's how fast amateur curlers curl in two hours. Also, oh, it's a time limit. For us, for us it is. In the, in the Olympics, it's <coughs> 10 ends. Yeah. So, they're, they're loving it. And it, it is extremely tiring. <laughs> this weekend, we did four four-end games, and I was beat. So, um, it's a lot more physical activity, you might think. Have you marketed it just for that as a physical activity? And it looks like it's too much a lot. It's a lot of core and links. So yeah, so there is um, again, like there is. I don't want to do it again if there's a good picture. Uh, yeah, so there, there is, it is a lot of position. It is, it is physically demanding. I usually get about twenty-five thousand steps when I'm out there from sweeping. Uh, however, again, because it's accessibility, you can do what's called stick curling, where you have a delivery stick and you can kind of walk out and push it. You don't have to be in the lunge position, and you can use that same technology for being in a wheelchair. So yeah, the physical aspect is pretty good. We are very restricted. We don't have to do a ton of marketing to get players on the ice. We sold out a 16 team league and we have no more ice time. Um, so that's, we, we've been trying to market a little bit different angle of it, but it's definitely why we stay, my wife and I stay involved, um, because we make, made a ton of friends there and because it's a great way to stay in the Steve. One of my girls was 
What's that? Great question. So I, I mentioned it was affordable, and if you, like most sports, you can spend a ton of money. But you, Steve asked if you need to bring equipment with you. All you would need is we'd recommend flexible pants, um, layers, because you might get warm, and clean gym shoes. Uh, we have sliders um, to go on the bottom of your feet, because you actually want the ice to be even slipperier than regular ice. We have grippers, we have brooms. We provide the stones, obviously, because they're $250 to $500 a pop. Um, so you, you really need nothing but your normal acti active wear. Just in the wintertime, we ask to make sure that you have absolutely no salt on your shoes because it's pretty damaging to ice, obviously. Are there protective pads, safety, or health there, So or there, there are, or? We, we usually don't have them, but they are available. Um, and you do see people wearing, especially heads, I've fallen and cracked the back of my head. It's, it's not fun, um, <laughs> but uh, generally, people do wear them sometimes. Um, Kind of like all sports, it's a personal preference, but they so are available. Fall, like what kind of protective wrist? Yeah, you'll see some people wear, wear elbow pads or definitely um, like padded stocking hats. So we, we do teach people how to safely fall on the ice, so that's, that is something we manage for. <laughs> Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I awesome, thank you. Perfect time to do some networking. Um, and then uh, we'll see you back here. I have to date my head and I've lost it. Uh, first part of April, first Wednesday of April, uh, for the next one when it comes. Thanks.